very informative panel. Um, and I think this is quite constructive, uh, again, uh, quite constructive for what has been a, a, as Mr. Hill outlined, a rather tiresome debate between retailers and banks on who holds the bag uh, without talking about progress or fixing the problem. They want Congress to intervene and make the decision on who gets sued. Um, so let's get beyond that. Let's get to the solution set. Mr. Boyson, uh, I'd like to hear your, the story of what your company is doing in Canada to verify identity um, and, and the, the undertaking you, that uh, you and your company have had. Thank you. Um, th there's been two uh, generations of services that we've launched in Canada. The first one was in 2012 and that we did with the government of Canada. It was designed to be a safer placement for multiple user IDs and passwords. In 2012, the problem the government of Canada had is every time I, as a, as a Canadian, I went to our tax authority, every single time I forgot the password. And so their challenge was, was how to authenticate me. They can't do what Amazon does. They can't do an email password reset. They have to send secure mail to my house. Being a busy Canadian, I solved my tax problem with them another way, and they sent me this thing two weeks later. I don't type it back in, and I come back here next year and do the same thing. That cost them 40 bucks a shot. Between the period 2004 to 2012, they spent $970 million authenticating 5 million Canadians. For the subsequent period, from 2012 to 2018, their costs have come down to roughly $200 million, an order of magnitude in savings. The reason is, is Canadians now are able to use their bank account to get to government. This has been transformational. The reason this works better is because Canadians are in their bank account every single week, and so they're not going to forget the password. More importantly, if they do forget the password, like if they can't get in, they're on DEFCON 5. They're going to run down to the bank right now because they're terrified their money's going to be lost. And it's that self-interest that has actually increased the integrity of the transactions. The challenge with that service, however, is that it was authentication only. It didn't solve the identity problem. So in May of this year, with all of the um, major banks in Canada and several other trusted partners, we launched an identity service that allows me to prove my identity to trustworthy way based on bank, telco, and government data that I authenticate with each of those providers myself, and then I'm able to, under my control, give that to someone else when I want to sign up for a new service. So this actually increases integrity for all of those endpoints and takes their cost down and gets them better results too. Okay, so verify me, right? Use blockchain uh, technology, walk us through that. Yeah, so we didn't start off saying blockchain's cool, let's use it. We came at it from a very different point of view. If an, any organization is consuming data from a, a network to confirm identity, they have three requirements that need to be met. Requirement number one is they want to know the data came from an authoritative source, somebody they would know and trust today, like a government-issued ID. The second requirement that they want to know is they want to know the data has not been altered since it was written by that authoritative source. The crook didn't take my driver's license, take all my data, scratch my photo, and stick their photo on it. The third requirement they have is they want to know the data belongs to the person presenting it. So let me answer your question about why blockchain. Blockchain does three very specific things. The first thing is it allowed us to implement this thing we call triple bind privacy. In Canada today, when I use my bank account to get to the government, the bank does not get to see my online destination. The government in its place knows that I came from a tier one bank in Canada, but not which one. And our company, which operates the network, we don't know who you are. Triple blind privacy says, triple blind privacy says not the bank, not the government, not security, you've got a complete picture of the user journey. Well, when we tried to go do that with identity, the problem was with us in the middle, we were going to get to see a lot. And we wanted to figure out a way to do triple blind identity so I could send my data from Wells Fargo to the IRS without Wells Fargo knowing it went to the IRS, without IRS knowing it came from Wells Fargo, without us seeing anything in between. So it gave us a method to implement triple blind privacy. The second thing, it allowed us to meet the integrity challenge to verify and meet those three requirements that I talked about. And the third side benefit is we get resiliency because there's so many nodes, it's harder to mount a denial of service attack. So broadly, that cryptography, the, 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 the blockchain cryptography has, has, is this leap forward in order to ensure that you can have that movement of data. But here's, my, here's a, in, a different question. Is there a different cultural assumption between the United States and, and folks in the United States versus co folks in Canada about their digital identity and that willingness to share that data? I would say the, the stance of Canadians and Americans is very similar on this front. I would say that the, the privacy regulations in Canada are, are generally better, and so that gives Canadians confidence when they're doing this. They have recourse if uh, something negative happens, they have somewhere to go and get it so sorted. Um, so I, I'd say the model would work here too is my sense. Excellent. Um, well, let's get, act, let's get at it, 
right? Pitter-patter, let's get at her. Let's make some progress here. Thank you uh, uh, for a great panel, highly informative. I've got three hours more of questions, but every one of you are top-notch. Thank you for being here.